Hello, Alex here with part one of my collaboration with Lomography UK on medium format macro photography and why not many people really do it compared to smaller formats. Part one is going to be the theory side and part two is the practical results. If you're already familiar with macro photography, extension tubes, reproduction ratio, this kind of thing, then just skip on to part two. There's no point hanging around if you know the basics already, but if you don't know all these kind of things and you want to get a better grip on the terminology and what we're really talking about, then do stick around for this one. We'll talk a bit more at the end about Lomography, but for now, let's get into it. So to start, we'll talk about the definition of macro photography. It has multiple meanings in the modern age, especially with, you know, point and shoots, variable focus distance, zoom lenses, and even smartphones nowadays, some of them have macro features, but true macro photography is where the subject in front of the lens is projected onto your imaging medium, whether that's a sensor, film, whatever, at life size. And life size means a 1.0x magnification or one-to-one -one reproduction ratio. This has nothing to do, as we'll see, with how big it is in the actual picture, but entirely to do with its relative size in the picture to its actual size. So I've obviously already touched on it, but the first thing I want to really dive into is reproduction ratio and magnification. I prefer to use reproduction ratio because one to five it just works better in my head versus 0.2x. You know, I mentally can realize the difference between 1 to 6 and 1 to 7 better than I can 0.167x and 0.145x. But that's just me. You might work better with magnification, so I'll try to use both. I have notes taken down. I'm not doing this. I'm not doing this ad lib, you know. So I've put together a few graphics that we can use to just vaguely demonstrate the idea of reproduction ratio or magnification and how it does not depend on the size of your image medium, sensor or film or whatever. So here we have a 35 millimeter full frame sensor. That's 36 by 24 millimeters. Then we have a very crude representation of a lens and a one euro cent coin. So in this case, this is a one-to-one -one macro lens and the coin is projected at a one-to-one -one ratio onto the sensor. That means the, what, are the, what is it like, 17 millimeter wide coin is projected 17 millimeters wide and high onto the sensor. Now we're looking at a one-to-two or 0.5x magnification lens. So you can see that the coin is much, much smaller in the image. It's half as wide and half as tall. So that means it takes up one quarter of the overall space. So the change in your magnification is very significant, even if it doesn't sound it. So the difference between, you know, it's half life size, it's half as big. Well, it's not. It's a quarter of the size because it's half as big in both uh, axes. And now this is where we get into the medium format stuff. So here we have 35 millimeter full frame versus a six by seven centimeter. Well, it's not really six by seven centimeters, but that's irrelevant. That's one of the medium format sizes. I picked it just because that's the size of the uh, Pentax 6.7 images. So if we take both of these with a one-to-one -one macro setup, you'll see that the coin is projected at whatever it is, 17 millimeters tall and wide onto the final uh, frame of film, which means if you scale the images to the same size, that is the same phone, the same TV, or an 8x10 print, whatever you do, the final image will show the coin as significantly larger in the full frame image than in the 6x7 image, because the reproduction ratio only controls the size of the object on the imaging medium. You can blow that picture up as big as you want after the fact, and that doesn't change your uh, initial reproduction ratio. So like I said, both images were taken at one to one, but when scaled to the same size, the coin appears significantly larger on the 35 millimeter frame than it does on the six by seven frame. Therefore, a larger format requires a greater reproduction ratio than a smaller format does for a given desired framing, i.e. 
a one to two macro lens on 35 millimeter can give you almost exactly the same results as a one to one macro lens on medium format or at least six by seven. And it's a lot easier to get to one to two than it is to get to one to one, both in terms of accessories, as we'll talk about now, or even just a dedicated macro lens. It's a lot easier to design a one to two macro lens than a one to one. So that just puts medium format at an automatic disadvantage. The second thing I want to talk about here is exposure factor, exposure compensation, bellows extension factor. It has a few different names depending on what kind of format you're working with. It's generally most often seen in large format photography, you know, those huge bellows type cameras, because as you extend a lens further away from your imaging medium, that light becomes more spread out. It covers a larger area, but that makes the light less intense, right? So we've all experienced this unknowingly at one point or another, even if you don't know what right now, what I'm talking about. So like if you've woken up, you know, first thing in the morning and you pick up your phone, you put it up beside your face and it's really bright. You, you pull the phone away from your face and it gets less intense. It's exactly the same thing inside the camera. As you move the lens further away, which you do when focusing extremely closely, that light becomes less diffuse on your film or your sensor because some of the light is kind of being wasted going around the, the imaging medium. And that's not a problem. It's just something that you need to be uh, cognizant of. Generally, this is not an issue at normal focusing distances because the level of extension of your optical assembly is very slight. So for something like the Canon 40mm f2.8, it's like four or six millimeters extension at close focus. I don't remember. So that's not really a problem, right? You know, in the absolute sense, that's a very small amount. But if you take something like the Pentax 135mm f4 macro, focus to infinity, it's, up. It's, it's pretty okay. But when you focus it down to one is to 3.3, that extends by a lot. And you need about like three quarters of a stop of extra light to compensate for this. So if you don't compensate for that, your images come out underexposed. And this is especially problematic when we're talking about a film camera as almost all medium format cameras are. So how do you actually know what your extension factor is, your exposure factor? Well, with large format photography, there are ways to calculate it. I don't do large format yet, so I haven't looked into this, but there are ways to calculate it very precisely, which is good. For digital medium format cameras, just take a few shots and work it out with your histogram. But for film cameras, you either have to use a bit of trial and error or find a resource online. So I'm very fortunate that I share the same system as Sasha Krasnov. Sasha has put out quite a bit of information on the Pentax 6.7 system, including the exposure factor for the various lenses tested and the extension tubes, which is very important for part two of this video. So thank you very much to Sasha for making that information public. I'll put links to the website down below and you can check that stuff out for yourself. So I didn't have to work this out, right? When I was doing the testing for part two of this video, I just went with it because I had this information freely available to me. But it's important to just to remember that you need to compensate for this, otherwise your images will not be exposed right. Especially if you were trying to do uh, like medium format slide macro photography on Velvia or something, your images will be trash if you don't compensate for the exposure factor. Additionally, certain cameras like the Mamiya RB67 actually have a compensation scale built in on the side of the camera. Now, I don't have my RB67 anymore, so I'll just put a picture of it up here. But it actually has a graph uh, printed in metal on the side of the body that shows you your required exposure factor given your focal length and your focus distance. And I think that's very, very cool. It's very handy because if you're not using a TTL meter, as you wouldn't be with a lot of medium format cameras, mainly if you're using a waist level finder, you have no really easy way to do this. I forgot to mention that. If you're using a TTL meter, the TTL meter will figure out the relative exposure for you. There's no problem there. Like when I'm using the Pentax 6.7 for macro photography, I prefer to use the waist level finder because of the little magnifier that makes it easier to achieve critical focus. But if I were to use the prism, the prism would work out the exposure factor for me. And that's very handy, but it's maybe not applicable to you, but I suppose it is good to know. Lastly, on exposure factor, I want to note that a lot of internally focusing macro lenses may or may not communicate the 
so-called effective aperture, decrease in light transmission to you. So for example, the Canon 100mm f2.8 macro, that will communicate f2.8 right down to minimum focus distance, but your shutter speed will get longer because the effective light transmission gets worse. Where something like the Nikon 105mm f2.8 G macro will tell you your effective aperture. And it's not that the aperture is changing, it's just a different way of communicating the relative change in exposure setting required. And I think that goes down to like f4.8 or something like that when it stopped down. And I saw forum posts when I was younger saying that, oh, it's a terrible lens, it, it isn't f2.8 at macro distances. It's like, well, neither is the Canon. It's just a different way of saying the same thing. The third bit of theory I want to talk about is diffraction. So some of you will have heard of this term outside of the context of macro photography already, but the shallow dive version of it is it's a physics phenomenon caused by having a very small aperture. So your images may be softer at f22 than at f11, even though the traditional wisdom is that stopping down your aperture will increase sharpness. There's nothing you can do about diffraction, right? It's caused by physics and the actual size of the aperture itself in the lens. You can't get around this. But diffraction is uh, something you have to be a bit more aware of when shooting macro photography, because when you shoot very close, your depth of field, your plane of focus is extremely shallow. So it can be very tempting to stop down to f22, f32, f64, if your camera supports it, to kind of maximize your depth of field. But then you might end up actually just killing your sharpness. So there's a balance to be found there. And when it comes to macro photography on film, wing it, to be honest, because you can't just, okay, you can, but you can't affordably just focus stack like you could with a, a digital camera. That's a technique where you would take a bunch of images, say at a, a sharper, less diffracted aperture, like f11 or something, and then stack them in software afterwards. Just take the in-focus slice from each of them, put them together into a single image. I don't do that, but a lot of people do, especially for like product photography and stuff. But that's kind of outside of the scope of what we're talking about here. Okay, so now we're going to talk about the practical ways that you actually achieve a macro style photograph. There are four ways and we're just going to go through them in the most obvious to the perhaps least obvious. Number one, a macro lens. A macro lens is one which is designed to be shot at, you know, really close focusing distances. I mean, theoretically, there's no reason that your 50 millimeter f1.8 nifty 50 cannot be used at a macro uh, distance you know there's no practical reason that canon nikon sony whoever could not have designed that lens to just twist out further um, and focus closer it's just that the image quality at those close focus distances will completely fall apart because it's not designed for it you know it's all about a range of acceptable quality Basically, a macro lens is designed for good image quality at infinity down to, you know, 30 centimeters or whatever the close focus distance is. That depends on the lens. Whereas a, a non-macro lens will be optimized for infinity down to some other distance that just is not macro. And if you push that lens closer, the image quality just isn't as good. So you'll see this a lot with like fast aperture lenses that don't uh, focus as close as their slower aperture counterparts. A good example being the Canon 50mm 1.2 versus the 50mm 1.8. They're like 65 and 40 or 35 centimeters close focus respectively. So there's a huge difference. And that's because the f1.2 at very close focus distances is very weak. So making it able to focus even closer would make it even worse. You get what I mean? Well, you can't tell me if you get what I mean, but I hope you get what I mean. So the main advantage to a macro lens is that it's a dedicated tool. It's optimized for this kind of thing. It will give the best image quality out of any of, the, any of these methods, hands down. The biggest downsides are one, you have to buy another lens. Two, you have to buy another lens. Macro lenses are pretty expensive, especially very good ones. They tend to cost quite a lot. You know, they're a specialized tool, so they're going to be more expensive. It's as simple as that. The second way to take macro photographs, and this is one of the cheapest, is 
extension tubes. So I showed this lens earlier, the Pentax 135mm f4 macro for the Pentax 6.7. When you focus it down to its close focusing distance, it gets longer. So we'll see if we can focus here on this. You can just about see the rear glass elements in the lens here. And when I extend this out, they're moving further away from you. The entire lens assembly is moving further away from the camera. And that's what an extension tube does. An extension tube is a very simple tool. It has a lens mount on either side. You put the lens in the front, couple the back to your body, and it just acts the same way as the body of that Pentax macro lens does. It moves the lens further away from the body and, and that allows you to focus more closely. So extension tubes come in different sizes. Here I have the full set of three for the Pentax 6.7. So for a short focal length, a small amount of extension has a greater effect. Whereas with a longer focal length, you need a huge amount of extension to get the same uh, boost in reproduction ratio or magnification. So on micro four thirds, with the comparatively very small focal lengths, a 12 millimeter extension tube is going to give you a huge boost. But here for the Pentax 6.7, this is like 93 or 96 millimeters total extension. And this only barely brings you up to one to one life size macro. And this is the thing with extension tubes. So larger formats for the same angle of view and the same perspective from the same position require a longer focal length than a smaller format. So extension tubes are less effective on 35 millimeter full frame and medium format than they are on APS-C crop and micro four thirds. Just because the actual focal lengths of the lenses generally used for the same framing from the same position are not the same. Uh, broadly speaking, there are two types of extension tube, dumb and smart. Dumb are these ones. They are hollow tubes. There is a little lever in here. You can hear it clicking. And that communicates the uh, information from the little aperture slider inside the body to the aperture mechanism in the lens. And that just enables the aperture to stop down when you take your picture. If you have autofocus lenses without an aperture ring, so like Nikon's AFP or the G-type AFS lenses, any Canon EF lens, you're going to need a smart extension tube which has electronic contact, which allows the camera to communicate to the lens even while it's extended further away. Otherwise, you might as well be using like a strip of a, like a toilet roll holder. There wouldn't be any communication between the lens and the camera and things like the aperture stopping down wouldn't work at all. A disadvantage of those smart extension tubes is that they're much, much more expensive. For like a regular system, you know, not medium format, something more common and current, you can get dumb extension tubes for like 20 euros for a set of three. But if you want smart extension tubes, you could easily be paying in excess of 100 to 200 euro for a, a full set, especially if they're OEM brand, which is crazy. But the advantage of the smart extension tubes is obviously you get the aperture control, as I said, but you retain autofocus, which is very, very handy. The third type of macro accessory are diopter filters or close-up filters. These are a simple piece of glass that you screw onto the front of your lens and it reduces your focusing distance accordingly. They come in a variety of strengths. I have a set that I picked up online going from plus one to plus 10. So I have a plus one, a plus two, a plus four, and a plus 10 filter. They're basically just glasses for your lens. You're adding in extra glass that just makes it focus more closely. Simple as that. The maximum focusing distance you get while these filters are attached is 1 over n, where n is the strength of the filter. And that is something that comes into play a lot with these. You get a broader range of focus than you do with extension tubes, as, at least with the weaker strength diopters. In direct contrast to extension tubes, the amount of benefit you get from it, not in terms of your maximum focusing distance, but your minimum, is directly proportional to the focal length of the lens. So a longer focal length lens benefits more from this. So a telephoto lens will benefit a lot more than a wide angle lens. So that should be part of your decision making process. If you're working with a micro four thirds system or an APS-C system using shorter focal length lenses, extension tubes may be better. But if you're working with telephoto lenses on full frame or a medium format system, these diopter filters may actually be better because again, from the same position, for the same perspective and same framing, you will be using a longer focal length lens. So you get more benefit out of these than you do the extension tubes. 
and that's why I bought these first. This is how I got the idea for this video before I reached out to Lamography. These filters are very cheap as well. I got the full set for 17 euros thereabouts. These are cheap. These are not high quality glass. And that is a general problem with uh, diopter filters. You're adding glass to your optical system. So the potential for degradation of your image quality is much, much higher than if you're using extension tubes, especially with something like the plus 10, which is our really thick boy, as you can see. You're adding more glass. So you're reducing, you're bending the light further. You're reducing the image quality that's coming out the back of your lens. There are high, high quality diopter filters out there, but they're really expensive. Like we're talking 130 euros for a single plus two filter, but they are much, much higher quality. So swings and roundabouts. Another disadvantage of the diopter filters is that they're filters that screw onto the front of your lens. They're not like the extension tubes that use your standard lens mount. So if you've multiple lenses with different front filter threads, you'll need a different set of diopter filters for each, or at least a, a, a big set and a bunch of step up rings. And I don't know how well that works. I haven't tried that out because 67 millimeters is already quite small compared to the lenses I have for this system. Outside of the context of the formal test in part two of this video, I find the quality to be pretty good. I've been using them with the 105 millimeter f2.4 quite a lot. I usually carry them around just under the lens cap and then take them off when I don't need them. They're pretty good, at least when stopped down. But I, I wouldn't try, I would try to avoid using them wide open or at least anything stronger than plus one wide open because they do affect your image quality a bit as expected, especially for these cheap Chinese brand ones. But when you stop down, that effect is mitigated somewhat and you can get away with them. I've never used the plus 10 filter personally myself. I find the image quality quite poor. It's very hard to even focus when, uh, even with the waist level finder when using the plus 10 because it, things just look smeary. So I don't have great hopes for the results of that in the actual test. That film is due to get here in about an hour. But the plus one, plus two and plus four are pretty useful overall. The fourth and final method of attaining macro images is a reversal ring. This is a weird bit of kit, right? They have a lens mount on one side and then a front filter thread on the other side. So straight away, same as the diopter filters, this front filter thread size will limit your choice of lens and what lenses can be attached to it. So what they do is they allow you to use the front filter thread of your lens to attach it to the lens mount of the camera backwards. It's pretty simple, but for medium format, they're not that great. I picked this one up because it was dirt cheap. I only paid 22 euros for this thing, including shipping. So that was great to be able to get it kind of accessibly for this video, because this particular one for the Pentax 6.7 is kind of rare. The main advantage of a reversal ring is you get extreme magnification if you're using the right lens. Easily 3x, 5x um, magnifications. That's three to one, five to one life size. So huge magnification. But depending on your lens, there are multiple downsides. The first, if you don't have an aperture ring, you can't change the aperture easily. You can, if you have something like a Nikon G lens, you can kind of use a bit of string to hold the lever. Or if you have a Canon EF lens, you could just take the lens off while the camera's switched on in live view. I don't recommend that, but there are videos of people doing it. You obviously don't have autofocus. Pretty simple. The autofocus motor is connected through electronics in the back of the lens. There is one adapter out there. I don't remember who makes it. I'll put a picture up here that kind of reaches around and connects to the electronic contacts on the lens and gives you autofocus, which is pretty cool, but it's a very cumbersome roundabout way of doing things. The second major downside is if your lens is not an internal focusing design. So, you know, if it does this when you're focusing, you don't have a focusing range you cannot actually change your focusing point. So I had planned to do a bunch of like minimum focusing distance versus infinity shots to check the focusing range, see how much kind of scope there is to change your magnification, your reproduction ratio with this. Turns out none is the answer. So that may prove to be very inflexible depending on what kind of shots you're trying to do. If you just want to get as close as possible, great. But if you want versatility, probably the worst out of these options. Lastly, and this is again a problem for medium format photography, not so much smaller formats. A short focal length lens or wide angle lens 
we'll take a, a very wide angle scene and then compress that into a very narrow angle cone at the back of the lens onto your sensor. So when you flip it around, you take a very small slice of the scene and project it very large onto the sensor, which is to say when you have a short focal length lens, you get extremely high magnifications like that three to one, five to one stuff I was talking about. But if you're using a longer focal length lens and God forbid a symmetrically designed lens, optically speaking, you get zero benefit from it. We'll see in part two that the 105 millimeter F2.4 is pretty crap with the reversal ring. The 135, its minimum focusing distance is like 13 meters when using the reversal ring, just because that's what that particular optical construction gives me. So to summarize, why don't people really do medium format macro photography? One, it's harder to get the same relative size of your subject in the frame for a given magnification. So you need a higher magnification, which is harder to achieve and harder to design, especially with film systems where most of these systems stopped being, you know, supported and produced decades ago. And no one is going to make a three to one lens for you now. Two, the most common method of attaining an increased reproduction ratio, the extension tubes are not as effective on larger systems because of the longer focal lengths needed to get the same framing and perspective from the same position as with a smaller system. So you get less benefit from them. The alternative diopter filters are inherently worse in the sense that you are adding glass to the system. So unless you invest a lot of money in an achromatic doublet type filter, you're going to be reducing your image quality quite a bit, which kind of defeats the purpose of using the larger negative of medium format. Thirdly, the exposure factor and general focusing issues that come with your very shallow depth of field just make it a difficult thing to do, right? It's a lot easier to slap a seven artisans macro lens on a micro four thirds camera and get super duper macro with exposure simulation and focus peaking than it is to do something like this. I was stressed out doing the testing for part two of this. I was basically sweating at one point, partially because of the heat wave, partially because I was just struggling to make sure I was getting everything right. Before we wrap up, I want to give a big shout out to Lomography UK. I reached out to them to collaborate on this video and I'll talk a bit more about the collaboration in the next video. But for now, Lomography are one of those companies that's keeping film alive at the moment and helping to broaden the range of people who are exposed to it. I personally know a few people who only got into film because some local shops around Dublin that don't stock photography or film kind of products stock Lomography products. So whether that's something like the Lomo Graph Lock Back 4x5 cameras, the simple use reloadable film camera, the Diana in basically every format you can imagine, different items and masks to help with scanning and all sorts of weird and unique films like the Lomochrome Purple and Metropolis or Lomochrome Teal. Maybe I can get my hands on a roll of that one day. Or the really low ISO Kino films or the Petsval lenses for SLR cameras. They're really doing something unique. And I know it's not for everyone. I know the idea of a reloadable, disposable style camera isn't for a lot of people. But if it's getting film into the hands of more people, then we are all directly or indirectly benefiting from them. Personally, I'm a big fan of their products and I want to pick up a copy of the Diana Instant Square relatively soon because I want to get into Instax type formats because Polaroid is crazy expensive and the Diana Instant Square is very flexible with interchangeable lenses. Okay, thanks for joining me for this rather long video. I didn't plan on it being so long, but I wanted to be rather thorough and include all of the things that I remembered and forgot to put in the script as I went along. If you enjoy what I do, please consider subscribing or donating to my Patreon where the tiers start at just one euro per month. If you don't already, follow me on Instagram at chaka1277. There will be a link down below for new pictures every single day. Take care and bye bye for now.